Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining Android Day on the Google Open Source Live. If you've never attended Open Source Live before, it's a monthly web series where each month we explore a different topic within open source. Today, of course, is all about Android. My name is Ali, and I have the pleasure of being your host for the day. I'm a program manager and have been at Google for five years, working across the company in cloud, YouTube, and the Android open source team. Today, we'll hear four sessions about what's new in Android. First, we'll cover developing Android in the open. Afterwards, we'll hear about the life cycle of a code change. Next, we'll learn how to test in the cloud using Cuttlefish. And finally, we'll finish by learning about security, updatability, and the future of AOSP. Don't forget to put your questions in the live Q&A forum right below the live stream window. Our speakers are ready to answer your questions live. And if you're viewing in full screen, you'll need to exit full screen to see the live Q&A forum. Our sessions have all been pre-recorded to allow for accurate transcripts and so that the speakers can focus on answering your questions live. Once we're done, don't forget to join us at the after party on Google Meet. You'll see a button to join in the event page at the end of the last session. And last but not least, use the hashtag GoogleOSLive to share your experience on social channels. Up first, we'll be learning about developing Android in the open. With that, Raman Tanetti and Ian Kasperzak, take it away. Hello, I'm Ian Kasperzak, technical lead for the Android open source team. And my co-presenter today is Raman Tanetti, a software engineer on the Android open source team. Today, we'll be talking about what Android is and what developing Android in the open means. For our agenda, first we're going to cover what is Android, and then we'll cover a little bit about Android development, and finally, we'll conclude with a day in the life of keeping the Android open source tree green. Android is the open source operating system for mobile devices and the corresponding open source project, which is led by Google. Everything you need to build, customize, port to new hardware, and meet compatibility requirements are all publicly available at source.android.com and android.googlesource.com. Android is the most widely adopted Linux-based open source operating system in the world. Contributions come from thousands of engineers across Google, our silicon manufacturing partners, and the open source community, just like you. It's all freely available to use, to audit, and to contribute to, which we hope you will consider doing soon. Android is continuously evolving its platform architecture through these three key ideas. First, it's layered. We want a well-defined API surface for apps to feel supported and also to give us backward compatibility via Jetpack. Second, it's modular. We have a clear separation between the framework and the vendor-specific code. We call this Project Trouble, and you can find out more information at g.co slash trouble. Finally, it's modular and updatable. This relatively new idea for Android we call mainline modules. They're modularized and updatable framework components, which enable us to have a faster release cadence for the framework outside of the main Android OS releases. How do we do this? We use a common kernel architecture with a common application binary interface, which enables these updated framework works to work across a variety of kernel versions. Now let's talk about the Android stack. At the bottom, of course, we have the Linux kernel. The Android kernel is based significantly upon the upstream Linux kernel, which is, of course, very well vetted and very secure. Except then we add the Android flavor to handle the many Android-specific form factors. Then we have the HAL and the HIDL. This is the hardware interface layer, which enables a common OS to communicate across the wide variety of form factors and hardware that Android supports. And above that, we have the native libraries in Android runtime. This is the core OS libraries and the runtime that you think of as the Android OS. Above that, there's the framework. This is where the interface between application and OS exists. We call this Jetpack or Android X. And finally, on the top, we have all the wonderful Android applications you are familiar with. Everything from games to productivity tools, from messaging to navigation. And I'm sure you can think of a few more. So why is Android so widely adopted? First, it's open source friendly. Secondly, 
It's incredibly customizable, as we can see from the wide variety of hardware and form factors Android has been landed on. Third, it's continuously updated, both through major releases every year and monthly incremental updates. Four, it's secure. It's designed from the ground up for security and gets regular security updates out to the open source. And five, and probably most important, our large and diverse community of developers supporting a wide range of applications and across a variety of hardware form factors. Android supports a robust, diverse, and worldwide ecosystem. We have 3 billion plus users, 10,000 plus handheld models, which I'm pretty sure would fill this room, and 1,000 plus OEMs, ODMs, and carriers all contributing to the world that is Android. Though most well known for running on phones, Android was originally designed to run on cameras. Yep, we didn't know where we were going either. Of course, times have changed, and now Android has grown to include tablets, watches, TVs, automobiles, a few things I'm probably not thinking of. And through the Internet of Things integration, Android can communicate with everything from your lights to your sound system to your refrigerator. Next, we're going to talk about how Android in the open source is developed and used. An Android release starts its life with the dessert release to the open source. They are called dessert releases because each major Android release is named after a tasty dessert. For example, my favorite donut, Android 1.6, or Oreo, Android 8, up to the most recent release, Snow Cone, Android 12. That release is then used by silicon manufacturing partners to add any silicon-specific code to support their given system on a chip, or SOC. The output of that work is a set of software libraries we call a board support package, or BSP, for interacting with the SOC. Device manufacturers then take that base BSP and customize it further for their unique device flavor and any carrier requirements. This is what creates the incredibly vibrant and rich ecosystem of Android phones that exist across the world. Then each phone SKU, the final Android OS software version, is tested for technical acceptance. So what is technical acceptance? Technical acceptance means meeting the OEM's quality standards, a mobile carrier standards, and possibly regulatory requirements, or a combination of all of these. This quality and compliance bar ensures the consistent, high quality, and secure experience for Android's end users they have come to expect. Though it is a relatively long journey from the original vanilla open source release to what is eventually landing on your phone, this is what enables Android to support a worldwide ecosystem of both hardware and software innovation built on top of the core Android OS. So what is available in the Android open source? The source is hosted on android.googlesource.com and it includes the core operating system framework, the Linux kernel, security libraries such as SE Linux and Trusty, the Android X libraries, also known as Jetpack, which support application development and provide the backwards compatibility support, and reference applications, which are intended for testing. So what can you build in the open source? Emulator images? the generic system image, which is for application validation, virtual cloud devices, which supports testing even if you don't have a local device available. You can build and test using this virtual device in the Android Code Lab. Kernel images, and finally, AOSP builds for both pixel boards and development boards such as the Dragonboard 845C. These builds do require an additional driver and firmware download. You can learn more about this at source.android.com, which covers a broad range of platform development topics. But if you're very new to Android platform development, I suggest starting with the code lab at source.android.com slash setup slash start. So what's not available? The device drivers for non-Pixel devices? The Pixel device drivers are available at developers.google.com slash Android slash drivers. The firmware, Google App Source, for apps you're familiar with, such as Gmail and Maps, and those tasty, tasty upcoming system UI features. They're coming. They're just not coming until the next version of Android is released to the open source, but you will see them eventually. Many, many Android teams develop directly in the open source branch, both for the Android platform, such as Bluetooth and Bionic and LLVM and Telecom, and Android support tools such as ADB or the Android Debugger and A-Suite and TradeFed, which are tools that support Android OS testing at scale. You'll be hearing from some of these teams that develop directly in the open source later today.
So where does the OS end and application start? This is a common question with all operating systems. For Android, the OS provides the application programming interfaces, or APIs, on which the diverse set of Android applications are built. Android Open Source contains basic apps which meet the OS compatibility requirements, but they're intended for compatibility testing via the Compatibility Test Suite, or CTS. If you want modern ideas of how to write an Android app, I suggest looking into the Android SDK and that team's excellent examples. Apps that will run on Android are available from a wide variety of sources, from the app stores like Google Play, as well as open source apps that you can download and build yourself, as well as apps you can just directly install via Android's APK package interface. The AOSP team is currently working on a plan to make the Android open source images with all Google apps available through ci.android.com. This will enable greater platform and application integration testing directly using the Android open source builds. In conclusion, the full functionality of the Android operating system is directly available in the open source and to the open source community. Next, Raman is gonna take you through a day in the life of keeping the Android open source branch healthy for developers. Hi, my name is Raman Teneti. I'm an Android open source developer. Today, I would like to talk about a day in the life of an Android developer to keep the Android oops, source tree green. Why is it important to keep the tree green? There are thousands of developers all over the world working on the Android source code. They all check out the source code and they try to build it. If a build doesn't work, they would not be able to make changes and test their changes. That is the reason we want to keep the tree green. So I had gone to this site called ci.android.com, and that is a screenshot of that particular site. In this site, you could see on the screenshot, there are certain things are green, red, yellow, and green. So let me briefly explain about what we are looking at. On the left-hand side are the list of changes that were checked into the tree during the, say, last some amount of time. The top one is the latest build that is going on. On the top of, top of the green, above the green, is the list of the targets that we build. Generally, here it is building the virtual Android open source tree called Cuttlefish. And then you can see when a tree, when a particular block, block is green, that indicates that particular change on that particular target is green. And if it is yellow, that indicates the bill has started, but it hasn't finished it. If it is gray, the bill hasn't even started. If it is red, that indicates that particular bill is not working on that particular target. So there could be somebody who could be working on that target. So we want to fix that as quickly as possible. So in this particular talk, I'm going to walk through how we could make a change so that we can maybe bring the tree green again. So this is an easy way to contribute to Android open source code by fixing a build and you are helping thousands of engineers. So I clicked on the view changes and if you click on the view changes, it shows list of changes that went into that particular bill. Each bill, we don't want to build for every change one bill. It will take, on average, each bill takes around 30 minutes. That would be too much, too many, too many resources being used to check the bills. So we pull the bills. So in this case, it's so luckily there was only one change. In nor normally, we get hundreds of changes in one bill. So there is an arrow there called artifacts and upper arrow. I'm going to click on it. Artifacts shows list of the bill and bill logs and JIT logs, bunch of logs that are that are collected when the bill was being built. So here I'm interested in build error log. Bill log consists of every target, every file that is compiled is logged into that particular log. Build error log shows only the errors. Here we are interested in the errors. So that's why I would click on the build error log and then see why it has failed. So clicking on the error log, it shows me 
that there is uh, the highlighted blue highlighted area shows me the error. So it so happens that the util start py is trying to include Python futures and it was not able to import that file. Python futures should have been there and there has, it, it should not have failed in that. There is a possibility somebody might have changed utils.py and thought that he doesn't need it, or maybe somebody deleted the Python futures. So there is a possibility of um, other changes that could have broken this bill. So let us go back to the word previous screen and let us look at the changes that were gone into this bill. Here, there are three things that are there. One is the subject, another is a project, another is a shop. Subject indicates what is the change, what is the summary of the chain. That, that summary is a change, changes, you remove the Python futures. And the project indicates their Android project consists of a bunch of projects. Uh, like I work on an Android desk clock, I just check out the Android desk clock instead of checking out the whole tree. And the SHA indicates the check-in. Let us click on the SHA to see what has he changed. If you click on the SHA, it indicates the change and it had the change ID. Change ID is the original change that was checked into the tree. And the change, it is in the red line, he deleted this particular thing, Python futures was deleted. So because he deleted it, we were not even able to check out that particular directory and because we could not check out the tree and it could not import it, that's why it has failed. So it looks like it is highly likely this is the change that caused the failure. Let us go and click on the change ID to see who checked in, how, why it has succeeded, why it has landed on the tree. If you're looking at the tree, this is the change that was checked in. And you can revert it at the right hand side corner that is there. If you click on the revert, that it could revert the chain. So there are two possibilities here. Either we can revert the chain or we can fix the chain, fix the um, broken bill. It, sometimes a chain, we recommend at Android that we should revert the chain. Reverting the chain is the best possibility because if you make a change, if you fix a chain, your fix can break the bills. Simplest thing is to go back to the where it was working okay. That is the reverting the chain. But sometimes a revert cannot be easily reverted because there may be other changes that are dependent on this particular revert. So in that case, maybe sometimes we have to fix forward. In this particular case, I would not think there is any other change that is dependent on this. Then so we can click on the revert and it will generate a CL and send it to the for review and the author who wrote the change can approve it and it could be submitted. This is an easy way of getting involved with Android development. So I will go to the, in summary, what we had today talked about is what is Android and how is Android, what is the development process of Android? And I gave an example of an Android developer, how he has kept the tree green by fixing a broken bill. In the next talk, we're going to talk about the Google infrastructure and how to keep the Android velocity and quality going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raman and Ian. It's wild to think about just how massive the Android ecosystem really is and to see how many teams are developing it directly in the open for anyone to join in on. Up next, we'll hear from Ian and Lance Pfluger talking about the life cycle of a code change. Over to you both. Hello, I'm Ian Kasperzak, technical lead for the Android Open Source team. And my co-presenter today is Lance Pfluger, engineering manager leading the system health and multi-device testing efforts for Android. Today, we'll be talking about how we use Google's infrastructure to ensure both quality and velocity when developing Android in the open source. We're going to start by following the life of a change list, or CL, that is created, reviewed, tested, and submitted through the Android open source branch. We will conclude with how to find the Android code lab so you can experience all of this yourself after today's sessions conclude. Of course, with any change, we begin with the source. 
The AOSP source is available at android.googlesource.com. And the Android source is a collection of Git projects synced using a custom tool we call Repo. The open source branch is roughly 50 gigabytes big, but mostly we're talking about the main or master branch there. If you consider all the branches that have ever existed in AOSP, it's significantly bigger. It's comprised of multiple languages, the most well-known of which is, of course, Java, but there's also C and C++, Python, and even a little Rust sprinkled there throughout the Android source code. Instructions on how to initialize and sync the source are covered in the code lab, and more info on that is coming up. Android is built with a build system we call Soon, but it's in the process of migrating to the more commonly known Bazel build system. More information about Bazel can be found at bazel.build. So you've synced the source, and of course you made your change, but now we need to test. First, you can test your change locally using your own device with the Android debugger, or ADB bridge. But if you don't have a local device available, you can use a local emulator or a cloud-based virtual device. And that's covered in the code lab, and we're going to talk in depth about the cloud virtual device in the next presentation. Common types of tests, of course, include functional tests, possibly more better known as unit tests, and also metric-based instrumentation and native tests. Now, you can either push tests to your device directly with ADB, or you can use a test, which greatly simplifies rerunning tests between code iterations. You can find more info about how to do testing at source.android.com slash compatibility slash tests slash development. So let's look inside a relatively simple test. Imagine we have a test start in the animator test class. First of all, what does this test do? Well, it's a pretty simple test. It starts the animator, and then it verifies or asserts that it's both running and that it has been started. Now we understand what it's doing, but how do we run it? Fortunately, a test makes this very, very easy. It's as simple as a test, animator test, number sign, test start. Nothing else, no dependency lookups or module lookups, no special parameters are required. A test really greatly simplifies launching tests on Android. So we have our change, we've tested it locally. Now, how do we get it submitted to AOSP? Well, this is the point at which you want to find an owner in the AOSP project to help you move forward. AOSP uses Garrett for code reviews. The Garrett UI provides a top level view of all changes currently being submitted and previously submitted to the AOSP branch, and it enables CL discussions via review comment threads. In addition, test automation runs on top of Garrett for every single change and provides test signals to change authors to validate the change is passing all of the pre-submit checks and tests before it's submitted to AOSP. Now, all AOSP changes must be code reviewed and approved by an owner. As Android is, of course, a very large collection of projects, there are a lot of owners across Android. But fortunately, Garrett provides a straightforward interface for finding an owner and reviewing your change with the Find Owners feature. So now that your change is in review and you have an owner reviewing it, it's being whisked away into Android's pre-submit testing infrastructure to verify it's ready to be submitted. We're halfway through our journey in the life of a code change, and now Lance is going to take you through its journey into Android's infrastructure. For the second part, we're going to cover continuous integration, including system health testing, test operations, when a change gets released, and a hands-on code lab you can try out for yourself. The CI system enables Android to develop at scale. When the owner marks a change ready, tests will run pre-merge and post-merge. These tests run on virtual machines in Google Cloud, enabling great scale, as well as on thousands of physical devices. The tests run on AOSP branches, as well as internal branches to ensure no breakages. For tests to be in pre-submit, it needs to be completed within 30 minutes and have a flake rate of less than 0.02% to ensure developer velocity. As part of the pre-merge testing, changes go through a series of static analyzers, also known as linters, that check for a wide range of things, such as ensuring the correct license is there, API coverage, and ensuring code guidelines are met. Post-submit testing runs on every build or on a set timed cadence, for example, every four hours. These tests can be less hermetic and take longer. Since there are multiple changes that may have occurred, they need to be triaged through automated alerting and by section tooling. System health includes things like power and performance. These are also very important. A specialized set of performance micro, macro, and stress tests are ran. 
there's a set of tools focused on processing, storing, visualizing, alerting, and bisecting on metric-based tests. Power testing, similar to performance testing, is also metric-based. Power tests have micro benchmarks as well as more user-realistic day-of-use coverage. Instrumentation is done through physical power meters as well as software-based data the device reports. Due to the system nature of this area, regressions may need to get escalated to a dedicated team with authority over power and performance. Builds and tests are kept green through a global rotation program of Android engineers that use established tools and processes to keep Android continuously healthy. Power and performance have dedicated monitors due to their complex nature. Android's policy is revert first, meaning bad changes will be reverted and then the author will be alerted to fix and resubmit their change. You may be curious when will an AOSP change be released? Typically in the next incremental release or depending on the cycle, the next overall major version release. Android 11 had 49 incremental releases and Android 12 has had 13 releases so far. After the talking sessions, we encourage you to try out the Android Code Lab. In this Code Lab, you'll get a hands-on opportunity to explore everything discussed in this presentation. Check out the Code Lab at source.android.com slash setup slash start. Next, Alistair is going to do a deeper dive on the Android Cloud Platform. Thanks, Ian and Lance. If you were inspired like I was from that talk to take the Android Code Lab, tell us about your experiences using the hashtag Google OS Live. Up next is Alistair Delva talking about building and running Android from the cloud using Cuttlefish. Take it away. Hi there, my name is Alistair Delva and today I'm going to be talking to you about our cloud Android uh, Cuttlefish reference device. Um, cloud Android is a uh, virtual platform for Android. Um, you can build it directly from AOSP, um, and it's a good way of um, trying out AOSP changes if you don't have access to a physical device that is supported uh, in the AOSP tree directly. So what exactly is Cuttlefish? Cuttlefish is a device port of Android optimized for virtualization. Um, this means that uh, it is handling the um, all of the nuances of what it means to be an Android device, but also trying to tailor those requirements to the available features for virtual platforms. Um, it's tooling support, uh, it has tooling support for both local and cloud execution. That means you can build and run Cuttlefish locally, or you can build Cuttlefish locally and run it on Google Cloud, or you can use a pre-built built on Google Cloud. And we do support or do plan to support in the future um, additional cloud architectures besides Google Cloud but it's reasonably straightforward to modify um, that cloud execution path to work on a different cloud architecture. It's scalable, reliable, and conformant. Um, so from scalability point of view, um, we're running millions of instances um, of this virtual device in our uh, continuous integration uh, system. Um, it's reliable in the sense that we try to make it as robust as a physical device. It should have be able to uh, be booted for a long period of time. It shouldn't run out of memory. It shouldn't crash and it's conformant in that it will uh, pass most of our um, conformance, Android conformance test suites, um, as you would expect for any physical device that's certified with uh, Android support. Um, it's deployed to support Android's continuous integration system, which we'll talk about more in a moment. And a question that we get quite often is, what's the difference between Cloud Android and the Android Studio emulator? So the straight answer is, the Android Studio emulator is designed really for stable APIs um, and app development. Um, Cuttlefish is more about the AOSP master, the living Android tree in AOSP, and it's targeted really at framework developers and um, people who want to make changes to Android in a way that uh, Cloud Android is, because part, Cloud Android is part of the AOSP code and it's, it doesn't require any special repositories or off AOSP master uh, changes, and um, it can be built in anywhere on any branch. Um, so it's just a sort of universally available um, virtual platform. It, it can also be used for app development as well. Uh, apps can be developed and then uploaded to Cloud Android and the studio will detect Cuttlefish as well. Um, it's, Cuttlefish is optimized for virtualization, so go deep, diving deeper into this, um, we use hardware virtualization, not containers. That means that each virtual machine that runs underneath the virtual machine manager has its own operating system kernel as well as system images. Um, we're VertIO based, which means that we are using the um, upstream Linux VertIO drivers for most of the functionality of the virtual Android environment, which means that we can actually boot, uh, the virtual device can actually be booted with upstream mainline kernels 
it doesn't require customized Android kernels to, to boot successfully. Um, we support x86-64, ARM64, and ARM v7a. And our kernel and system images are kind of full ones, which means that we, we can support running the same GKI, generic kernel image artifact, and GSI, generic system image, that a, uh, a physical device would run. Um, because we have implemented a bootloader that will load the kernel and system images in the same way that uh, a physical device does. So uh, one of the main targets for our optimized for virtualization effort is uh, high quality device synthesis. That means that where possible, we'll virtualize devices. Um, we won't emulate them. Um, and, uh, and in cases where we can't do that, we'll provide a high quality emulation or high quality synthesizing, uh, synthesis of that device um, like a simulator, for example, our uh, modem simulator for simulating the LTE modem on a phone. Um, another available option with uh, our virtual platform is hardware GPU acceleration. That means that any GPU content you would run in an Android operating system can be accelerated by your host GPU. So if you have a GPU on your cloud instance or on your local machine, it will use that to enable you to run things like games and other 3D content that would normally not work very well in a virtual device. Tooling support for local and cloud execution is provided. Um, most of the time when you're interacting with the virtual device locally, you're going to be using the launch underscore CVD command. This tool is built for you automatically in AOSP. When you launch the uh, Cuttlefish device, uh, build it, you'll find that this binary is put into your path and you'll be able to use this binary um, to, to launch the virtual device. Um, alternatively, if you want to uh, build, uh, you know, launch a virtual device on Google Cloud, we also provide a reference tool in AOSP called ACloud, and you can use the ACloud create command to create a GC instance, which can then run um, a Cuttlefish virtual device inside it. So the Cuttlefish uh, environment will be will be downloaded into that GC instance, and it will run on the Linux environment provided by the GC instance on the nested virtualization, and then provide an Android uh, device that will be accessible over the internet. Um, all of this support for both cloud and local execution is in AOSP. This solution is deployed uh, with Android's pre-submit CI. So we, we trust the solution. Um, we're running it to about two and a half million tests a day for Android pre-submit on the Cuttlefish virtual device uh, through our tree hugger tool. Um, so every time you upload an AOSP change, it's going to be built for Cuttlefish and tested on Cuttlefish on Google Cloud. So look out for that AOSP underscore CF underscore x86-64 phone user debug tag. That's indicating that um, your test has uh, executed successfully or has failed on the virtual device um, uh, as part of our tree hugger pre-submit. Um, um, we, but we also use the virtual device not just for the AOSP platform, but also for the Android common kernel. So the common kernel, which is used by most ecosystem devices, um, runs directly on the virtual device. And you can, you can check out that repository and you can switch to basically any branch from the last few years of the kernel, any version, and you'll be able to use those kernels with the virtual device. So if you're a kernel developer and you want to test a kernel feature, or you want to test an Android kernel feature um, that doesn't have a uh, physical device dependency, then you should you can use that uh, with the Cuttlefish virtual device. So what do you need to do to get set up to actually run the Cuttlefish virtual device? The first step is you do need to install the Cuttlefish common package on your local or cloud instance. Um, so we only support Linux um, for Cuttlefish. And your distro kernel must be uh, typically greater than, greater than or equal to Linux 5.4 because it must support uh, the VSOC feature, um, which we use, uh, the virtual device uses. Um, installing Cuttlefish Common uh, also provides you automatic setup for network bridging. And it sets up permissions of various device nodes so that you can access those devices and those network bridges as a non-root user on your system. So you can run the virtual device in a secure way. Um, this also automates the process of running multiple uh, Android versions and many simultaneous Cuttlefish devices. Um, and so installing this package, we just automates all of the, the hard uh, configuration parts uh, for setting up the virtual device. So on the right-hand side, you can see the commands on the left-hand side being executed and what the kind of console output should be when you're, when you're building and installing this package. Um, so our package is optimized for Debian-based distributions. Um, but the, the code and the scripts that it installs is fairly straightforward, so it should be quite easy to adapt to other distribution types if necessary. Um, so the second thing you're going to do once you have installed Cuttlefish Common is set your user up. You're going to want to make sure that you're in the KVM group, which means that you have access to uh, Linux K, uh, kernel virtual machine. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you're in the CVD network group, which gives you access to the Cuttlefish virtual devices networking configuration, the network bridges. 
And you're also, if you're going to use the QMU uh, Virtual Machine Manager, going to want to make sure that you're in the render group. Um, and when you're in the render group, that will, and you use QMU, it will enable the GPU acceleration feature, which is required when you're running with QMU. Um, but if you're using CrossVM, um, you can uh, run with or without GPU acceleration, and you don't need to be in the render group. Make sure you've installed OpenGL ES and Vulkan capable drivers because those capabilities are exposed to the Android OS. And uh, if they're not installed, it will fall back to software implementations. Um, when you set up your device, you should be able to see that various uh, network bridges are, and network tap devices are created for you to provide the mobile data, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet capabilities for the virtual device. The CVD WBR bridge will uh, provide the Wi-Fi uh, connectivity to all of the um, uh, Android instances. The uh, CVD ETAP uh, EBR bridge will be providing Ethernet functionality for wired Ethernet. And the CVD MTAP devices, which are not bridged together, they're on private uh, IPv4 slash 30s, uh, will set up a mobile data point-to-point -point connection for each of your virtual machines. Um, and if, you do, if your Cuttlefish device won't start, make sure you reboot before trying again. We, we do know that there are some problems with some distros uh, loading some parts of the Vertio transport driver in a way that doesn't allow us to later on load uh, the VSOC accelerator. Um, so just try rebooting after you've run installed uh, CVD, uh, the, the Cuttlefish common package, and run through the CVD setup in this in this slide. Um, so once you're set up with Android, you've rebooted, you want to try it out. You want to actually see, can I download a Cuttlefish virtual device? Can I run that um, on my uh, local machine? Um, you're going to want to go to ci.android.com. And uh, this will allow you to download these uh, packages that are pre-built uh, in Google's infrastructure and have been boot tested and verified on the virtual device. So you can uh, normally you're going to go, when you go to ci.android.com, you're going to see that it's on the AOSP master branch, which is probably the branch you want. You can download the, any build that is tagged CF, AOSP underscore CF, but make sure that you pick the one, the right architecture, because we do have builds for ARM64 and x86-64. And normally you're going to want the x86-64 versions. So pull down those builds um, to your local machine. The packages that you need are the cvd host package tar.gz file. And this AOSPCF x 664 phone dash img dash then the version number of the build um, dot zip. When you extract each of those packages to your home directory, you'll be able to run uh, bin slash launch CVD, and you should see the virtual machine start up. But if you're actually going to want to make a change to AOSP, you're going to want to make some uh, change to the platform. You're not obviously going to be able to use a pre-built in that case, and you're probably going to want to build locally. So you can follow the normal AOSP source build steps, which is to uh, clone the AOSP tree down to your device. And then at the launch step, you're going to want to select uh, AOSP CFX86 phone user debug. And uh, we do have other launch targets available for TV, for automotive, um, for foldable devices. So you can just run launch by itself to see all of the available virtual devices uh, types that you can select from. But the normal one is AOSP CFX8664 phone. And then you're going to do a full build of that uh, virtual device based on that launch target. And then you should be able to just run the launch CVD command to launch that virtual device. So once you've done your build and you've uh, maybe validated that your configuration is, has been done correctly, um, you're going to want to, you might want to see if you can deploy that image to uh, Google Cloud so you can start setting up um, uh, maybe a cloud streaming service or a scalable testing infrastructure based on those builds. So if you do have interest in doing that, the A-Cloud tool can be used at this stage to deploy your locally built image and your local changes. Um, you can run the uh, A-Cloud create double dash local dash image uh, command, which will take the build that you have done locally and copy it to your Google Cloud instance. Um, you need to set the A-Cloud tool up with its configuration file to, to uh, match your uh, GCP project your Google Cloud project, um, and and uh, there's various other com uh, configuration parameters that can be set for A-Cloud. Um, and then it will create an instance for you when you run the A-Cloud create command, which will be managed with the uh, A-Cloud list and A-Cloud delete commands uh, as necessary. And this instance that gets created for you will be will contain the um, a, a host image that is capable of running Cuttlefish, and then you can run the Cuttlefish image on top of those stable host images. So. What if you want to make more kind of detailed changes to your Cuttlefish Common install? Maybe there's some advanced uh, use cases that you're interested in. So the, the Cuttlefish Common configuration file does allow you to control the number of network bridges um, that are created for the virtual devices, which is essentially the limit of the number of virtual devices you can run on your machine at the same time. Um, so if you have one big machine, you might want to increase this numCBD accounts value to be a large number, like 16 or even greater. Um, if you do that, it will create numerous... Um, 
tap devices for the virtual machines to connect to for all of those uh, different um, uh, virtual devices running on that single machine. Um, another thing you can do is you can, uh, if you've created a network bridge uh, of your uh, physical network connection, internet connection, um, you can bridge the virtual devices uh, to, the, to that network bridge so that it will seamlessly utilize the DHCP server and internet connectivity uh, of your net local network instead of using uh, NAT uh, and uh, its own DHCP capability. You can enable that by just specifying the bridge interface parameter and you can individually control IPv4, IPv6 bridging uh, by uncommenting the uh, IPv4 bridge, IPv6 bridge commands. You can also change the DNS servers used for mobile data connections. Uh, they will default to the Google DNS servers by default, but you can change them to be different DNS servers if you want to change the mobile data connectivity. And some advanced features that kind of play into these configuration files. Um, Launch CVD dash num instances allows you to control the number of virtual machines that will get created simultaneously using the build that you have created. So by default, it will only create one virtual machine. But when you run with Launch CVD num instances three, it will create three virtual machines based on the build that you have locally. And uh, they will all get their own internet access. But they'll also be able to talk to each other through the ethernet or Wi-Fi connections. Um, overriding the kernel, you can do that with kernel path and init ramfs path. Um, you, spec you can do a kernel build, like a different GKI kernel, for example, and you can build a module package for the virtual device, which is the init ramfs image file. And the cuttlefish launch will take those artifacts and it will, it will automatically replace the artifacts that were pre-built in the AOSP build with uh, ones that you have built yourself. So if you're a kernel developer and you want to do local booting of a kernel um, without doing a, many, making any platform changes or integrating that kernel into the AOSP tree, you can use those flags to do that. And then finally, if you are a kernel developer and you want to use uh, the GNU debugger to debug the kernel, you can also specify the GDB port option and that will create a TCP IP port you can connect to using GDB's target local feature. So once you've connected, once you've started the virtual device with the launch CVD command, you're probably going to want to connect to it in some way. And we provide a new, uh, numerous different ways of uh, debugging the virtual device. The first way is the uh, WebRTC um, connection. That's going to show you the frame buffer for the virtual device. It's going to allow uh, camera feeds to be fed to the virtual device, audio to come back from the virtual device, and also send keyboard and mouse inputs and touchscreen inputs. Um, so you can do that by just connecting to localhost 8443 in your web browser. Um, you can also use the uh, Android debug bridge with ADB shell. Um, and, and then you can use the, if you if there's an issue that you have, the, the ADB shell, um, that uh, an ADB shell is the same type of command that you would use on a physical device to debug physical devices. Then you can also use the raw console, um, which will act, give you access to the Android boot console, which is a, a console process that's running on a system UART. So that will be created earlier than the ADB daemon will start. So if you're trying to debug an early boot issue, the raw console might be useful for that. Um, all the printed messages from the kernel, from the bootloader, from the early Android boots process will go out to the kernel log. And anything that uses devk message will also go out to the kernel log. And for every other piece of logging that you might want to uh, analyze, we also capture the ADB logcat through a serial port, and we we dump that out to a file. So using this file as an alternative to ADB logcat can be faster because the file is being streamed to your local disk, um, and that might make it easier to search, for example, for specific things that you're looking for. And um, so these are kind of advanced debugging features, advanced debug access that you maybe would not have on a physical device if you were trying to do uh, low-level platform debug. So something we get asked about a lot is uh, ARM support. Um, so ARM is um, something that we uh, we know is very important for some developers. If you're running a specific application that's optimized for ARM64 or you're using making a framework change that depends on ARM64-specific um, changes, then you're going to want to be able to build and, and execute an ARM64 virtual device. So Cuttlefish does support that in AOSP. You can uh, launch AOSP CF ARM64 phone instead. And if you do that on a workstation that is maybe an x86-based workstation, it will support that uh, feature. It will allow you to run that virtual device through software emulation, but that is about 15 to 30 times slower than using hardware virtualization on a real ARM64 device. So you have to ask yourself, do you really need ARM64 for your use case? Um, if you're doing a generic change to the framework and you have a commodity PC or a server, you probably just want to use the x86-64 build. You probably don't need the ARM64 build. But if you do want to run ARM64 and you want to run it with hardware virtualization, we, we do support running a Cuttlefish on multiple different ARM64 development boards like Rock Pi, Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, this option is tested less than the um, x86-64 based uh, CI infrastructure, but it, we, we do believe that it should work quite well. And uh, recently in AOSP, we've also added support for a 32-bit ARM. 
Um, but this is currently only supported through uh, QMU software emulation, and it does not support not supported through hardware virtualization. There's just some more work to do to make that work um, with a most likely ARM64 development board using the ARM64 hardware virtualization features. So the last thing rounding out really is um, all of hopefully everything that I have discussed in this presentation is also documented at source.android.com slash setup slash create slash cuzzlefish. It should walk you through the process of creating a virtual device yourself. Um, and we, we're very uh, interested in any AOSP contributions, of course. They're always welcome for uh, device, Google, device Google, Cuttlefish, and AOSP. Um, examples of things that, we've, uh, that have been contributed to us recently are uh, streaming webcam support um, and our mobile, uh, changes to our modem simulation. Um, so we do appreciate those AOSP contributions. We are an AOSP first project. That means that we develop all of our features for the virtual device in AOSP in the open and open source way. Um, so everything you're fetching down, pulling down from AOSP will be the latest Cuttlefish code, the latest um, capabilities um, available in uh, for the Cuttlefish reference virtual device. So um, we do uh, appreciate any contributions that you can make to those changes. Um, and uh, most likely your code will be, will be merged into our project. Um, yeah, so um, obviously uh, uh, looking forward to you guys trying out the virtual device um, and um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alistair, for showing how it's now easier than ever to build and test AOSP in the cloud. Last but not least, we have our final speakers. We'll hear from Jeff Hamilton and Lars Bergstrom about security, updatability, and the future of AOSP. All yours. Hi. My name is Lars Bergstrom, and I'm here with my colleague, Jeff Hamilton, to talk about AOSP first development. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about why you would develop out in the public and in the open rather than internally, um, and then dive in a little bit on how the external collaborations are enabled for my teams. Then I'll hand off to my colleague, Jeff, to talk about updatability. So, we really try on the Android platform team to do almost all of our feature development in AOSP first. There are some things that don't get developed. There are still some teams that are in transition or there are things like security fixes that need to be done internally and privately before they can be shared out. But even in those cases, we try to make sure that when a new Android dessert release comes out, uh, within 48 hours, we have the fully updated source uh, available to everyone so that they can see it and, and build it themselves. Now, why do that, right? Developing in the public is hard. It opens you up to scrutiny. There are additional conversations. But really, for us, there are four big reasons that, that we like to do our development in AOSP first. So the first one is transparency. One of our big promises to Android developers and Android users is that this is a secure and private operating system. And it's hard to believe those claims unless you can actually see the source code, see the compilers, test them out, see how we're building it. Look at all of the different memory sanitizers that we're using, the languages that we're using to sort of audit which pieces are being implemented in memory safe languages like Java or Rust, which of them are being implemented in C++. The second big piece is around reviews. When we make our changes in the open, it gives the opportunity for other people to take a look, provide feedback, um, and do so much earlier than they would be able to if we just released all of the code as a source dump once a year. So this basically allows us to get that feedback when there's still time to edit what's going on, to change the course and, and make updates to the system. The third big piece is collaboration. So uh, we don't build Android alone. We rely on a lot of third-party code. We also work with a lot of partners out in open source, whether those are corporations, foundations, or even individuals who like to participate in, uh, in the Android project and its work. And I'll leave uh, updatability to Jeff when, when he talks a little bit later. Open source is at the heart of everything that we do, and not just the portion of the 100 million lines or so of Android code that we write, but also the 75% of that that is upstream projects, so other open source projects that we contribute to and that we use within Android. And so 
this basically by working upstream with those projects and have it working in the open, we can work directly with the upstream versions of those projects. If we had private branches of all of our code, then we would also have to have private branches of all of those open source projects because any change that we were making internally, we would not be able to reflect externally without disclosing private information. So really by working in the open for AOSP, this also enables us to work in the open with all of our partners and all of the other open source projects that we critically rely on. So one of my teams is the native tools and libraries team. And basically what they work on are not just the compilers, not just the C++ and Rust compilers, but also things like the LLVM tool chain, which includes not only the code generators, but also all of the, all of the stuff that tidies up the code, that, that lints to check for errors in the code, or even the debuggers that work directly against the compiled code. We have hundreds of libraries that, that we bring in, including our memory allocators. For example, JE malloc, which we use on devices that have a little bit less memory, or Scudu, the, the hardened allocator that uh, we use on devices that have more memory. And there are profilers and performance tooling that are used not only by platform developers, but also by application programmers, whether directly from the command line or through Android Studio uh, that enable analysis of the programs and the system uh, to determine if whether resources are being used well. And so all of these require not just kind of collaborating within our, our teams themselves at here at Google, but also with all of our partners. So when someone like ARM adds a new instruction, for example, uh, instruction retired counters, um, that has to be plumbed all the way through all of the infrastructure. So basically adding support to the profilers to be able to trigger it and track it to all of our performance reporting tooling so that people can see and correlate this with other work. And if we had internal branches um, because of all of the legal stuff that we would have to get in place for, for that sort of private coordination, they wouldn't be able to see each other's work. So we would be managing these patches where ARM has added some set of features and our SOC partners might have added, added some other features. And then even our OEM partners might have added some and we would have to manage all of these patches and who knows whether they work together or how we make all of this uh, sort of come together at the end before we actually ship a dessert release. So it enables us not just to work well with, with other people, but for them to bring in and work uh, across with one another as well. Another thing that this allows us to do is not just work sort of on our own internal Android projects, but also to work more upstream directly with the projects that we rely on. So Android runs on top of Linux, um, uses the SC Linux uh, secure, uh, secure hardened uh, version in, in order to execute Android programs. Um, and one of the hard things there is that both the the compilers that are used to compile Linux, as well as Linux itself, move very, very rapidly. But by working in the open, what this enables us to do is take our source code and our tests and run them all the way upstream. So directly where people are contributing changes to the compiler or to the, uh, or to the operating system itself and run our tests as those changes are coming in to make sure, was there a regression? Did something break Android? Is there something that's no longer uh, optimized anymore? If we didn't do that, if all of our code was internal and we just consumed these projects, we might not know for days or even weeks when a regression happened. And because these projects move so rapidly, even if we identify the regression and then identify a fix, the code has probably continued to change substantially. So now we're chasing a running target, as they say, to try and get this code changed and a fix landed when a lot of new code may have landed that, that causes that to be really difficult. And so by working directly upstream, this enables us to uh, rapidly turn around fixes and be better partners to those projects. No surprises. We can show them exactly what broke, exactly what we needed to fix, um, and, uh, you know, or change our tests to make sure that, that to adopt to the new behavior. This team also produces a set of development kits. So basically the tools that end developers use in order to uh, produce their applications. And so beyond even the source code that we make, we also make all of these packages, all of these binaries available because not every developer has a 96 core machine and a, and a ton of disk space in order to build all of Android so that they can see a new version of the compiler. Um, but they do have the ability to just plug in all of the new builds based on AOSP to check out these new 
compilers and tools to see if there are either new features that they want to use, new APIs they want to target, or or just new compiler uh, issues that they want to track down. So we just got a bug on our GitHub issue tracker for the NDK that identified a compiler regression. In one case, we were uh, we we used to be generating some really good optimized neon code for ARM in one case, and now it doesn't. And now we don't have access to any of this code, right? This is third party code, but um, they can give us some repros and we can try and turn around a fix, whether that's directly in Android or whether that's upstream with LLVM and the rest of the compilers, um, and then push out those binaries and ask them to give it a try again. This is something that if we just had closed source development and we just had beta releases, it would be really hard to perform this sort of rapid iteration with our community. Our community developers also tends to have access to a much wider set of hardware, including early access hardware, uh, that we might not have access to at Google. So um, specific configurations of Windows, such as the Insider builds, they might be working right on, on new ones there. Also the new M1 ARM Max, we didn't have access to those for quite a while. And so we were able to get feedback from our community about how our tools were working on those in terms of either performance or functionality and iterate with them even before we have access to that hardware. So that's another thing that AOSP lets us do that we really wouldn't be able to if they were if we were doing all of our work inside of internal private branches. And so the last thing on my team that I wanted to talk about is the Android runtime. So ART is the managed runtime that's used by applications in almost every system service on Android. Um, you're probably familiar with it because this is what all of the Java and Kotlin code directly target. Um, but what many people don't realize is that this runtime is used by every native uh, application in order to make system calls, in order to get intents or, or activations. It all comes in through this runtime. Um, and so like native code, this allows our partners and, and the broader ecosystem to see what's coming. So right now we're working on a new garbage collector, which is the which is the part of the runtime that manages and reclaims memory and allocation. So uh, this tends to have a pretty high impact on, on user programs. So uh, it's really nice to be able to share this early with them so that everyone can see how it runs, not only with their application, but on a different set of devices um, with different memory configurations and different sets of services running um, to make sure that it really runs well for everybody. Um, also, one of the differences about the Android runtime compared to the native tools is that for the native tools, you you build your binary once for every 64-bit ARM device, and that's the that's the binary that we're going to ship to every single device. Art is going to generate code on a specific device, so there are opportunities for uh, our partners to come in and say that ARM wants to do a particular optimization for. Uh, the only devices that have ARM v8.2 available, this gives them the opportunity to, gener to generate better code that has specific optimizations. So I, my team tends to focus more on the broad ecosystem, making sure that the, the broad set of 3 billion devices ac across Android generally work really well and safely and in, in a high performance manner. But some of our partners may want to do specific fixes for individual devices or individual chipsets or or even new things that are coming out that are not yet widely adopted. And by working upstream in AOSP, this, this allows them to actively collaborate and land and test those fixes without having to do so um, behind internal branches where where none of our our community could actually try it out and see how it works in practice so now i'm going to hand over to my colleague jeff hamilton who will talk with you about improving android updates through aosp thanks lars uh, i'm jeff hamilton and i run the project mainline group within android and i'm here to talk to you today about how mainline and works well with aosp and uh, AOSP helps us out with our development. So first let's talk about what is Project Mainline. Uh, it's a program to modularize the core components of the AOSP platform and to update them via Google Play. Uh, so some good examples are ART, the runtime that Lars uh, talked about a few slides ago. Um, we also have portions of the media system. Uh, we have things like time zone databases, so uh, your device always knows what time it is if the governments are changing that on you. Um, we also have things like ADBD to make sure there's a single implementation for developers across the ecosystem, and uh, they should be able to debug all the devices without problems. As we're modularizing these core components of AOSP, um, a really important aspect of that for us is that the code for the modules remains in AOSP, remains open source. 
Um, these modules are built by Google. Uh, they're built from the sources that are published in AOSP. Uh, so that allows you to inspect the code for the binaries that are running on your devices. Um, not all devices in the ecosystem are getting regular platform security updates. Uh, so with Mainline, we're able to reach a lot of users that are on you know, older devices that might not be getting software updates anymore. Uh, and the security updates that are delivered you know, more broadly um, and more quickly to users as they go through Google Play. Um, and the module updates are also delivered to, you know, to all devices that have uh, those modules included on them, regardless of manufacturer. Okay, so what are mainline modules? Um, an important aspect, as I mentioned before, is they're still open source as part of AOSP. Um, the modules are built against stable APIs, and we run them through uh, an extensive testing and validation process before we release them. Um, the, the, test, the automated tests as part of that process are included with the source code for the modules in AOSP as, as well. Uh, so if you find a problem in one of the modules, uh, you know, we encourage you to write a new test that shows that problem and, and submit it to us, and we'll take a look and fix the bug and get the test running again. Another important aspect of you know, modules is that they're developed by many members of the Android ecosystem. Uh, and it's not just Google participating. Uh, as Google's you know, delivering these updates to all devices, uh, we have many manufacturers that are contributing to make sure that you know, they have the features in, that they need for their uh, devices. The modules are also delivered atomically out to devices. So we ensure that the combination of binaries that went through our testing validation suites is that's exactly what's installed on the device. So you don't end up with different versions of different modules installed that weren't tested together. Uh, the modules are also moving towards their own branches, um, which allows you to more easily download and inspect the source code. Uh, right now, the modules are kind of part of the full Android platform, and uh, that requires downloading a lot more source and, and having a lot more than you need if you're just looking at a single individual module. As the modules become kind of more distinct from the Android platform, uh, it's, you know, I want to talk about the release cadence there. And Android as the platform you know, has one big, large annual uh, dessert release. Um, and there are monthly security updates that do happen through AOSP and, and are delivered to devices. Um, as the mainline modules, the updates often carry security patches. Um, we have aligned the updates that we're doing and, uh, with those monthly security patches to make sure that uh, the updates go out at the same time as the, uh, the, the full platform updates go to devices and uh, to also make sure that we don't uh, end up releasing the source code for either the platform or for the modules in a way uh, that you know, kind of discloses a security vulnerability in one, but not the other. Um, the modules also uh, have release branches that are uh, tagged in AOSP. So um, you can go in and, and you know, get exactly the code that's running on the device. So this kind of raises the question, what is AOSP? Um, it's often used interchangeably to talk about the set of Git repositories uh, that are hosting uh, the stuff. It's also used to talk about the platform itself and you know, the operating system that is Android. Um, and that you know, gets a little bit confusing. Um, as, as we move to modules, you know, they're both part of, part of the Android platform as uh, you know, they, uh, they contain really important aspects of it, like the runtime. Um, but they are developed on their own schedules and released independently, both as binaries and as source code. We do release the source code to the AOSP Git repositories, but that does often happen at a different time as the Android platform. Um, so as we're talking about AOSP here, you know, there's kind of a, a bit of an evolution that's happening as we're separating out the modules. Um, AOSP kind of becomes a place to host uh, the modules as well as the rest of the, the uh, platform that's not been modularized. Uh, we are working on separating out uh, the branches, so it's much easier for you to get modules if that's what you're interested in, um, and you don't have to download a branch that has the entire platform. So tying it all together, what's the impact of this new updatability capabilities that we have, and you know, how does AOSP help out there? Uh, for users, many users will receive security updates on a more regular basis. If the device is receiving, uh, say, quarterly updates, or maybe some devices don't receive security updates at all. Uh, for the code that's in the mainline modules, users will get monthly updates um, with the latest security patches. Uh, having a single binary across the ecosystem also helps reduce fragmentation. 
Um, and reduced fragmentation is really nice because it should reduce the compatibility workload on app developers. For example, they don't have to worry if class loading works differently on one device to the next. Uh, the, the runtime should be the same everywhere, and uh, they only have to worry about one, implement in, one implementation of the runtime. Uh, the source code for modules does continue to remain part of AOSP, which does allow uh, people to download the source code and inspect exactly the code that was used to build the binaries running on their devices. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the AOSP code, as it's being delivered to the entire ecosystem, uh, is now meeting all the requirements for all devices in the ecosystem. So there might be some devices that you know, had additional features in certain areas. Um, now, with a single implementation uh, that meets all the requirements for all devices uh, and make sure that you know, the code that is in AOSP is really production ready for everyone. And that's all we have. So thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Jeff and Lars. The impact of main, mainline modules has been incredible. And it was great to see this vision into the future of AOSP. All right, that's a wrap. It's now time for the after party. Come join us at the after party by clicking the watch live button on the events agenda page to be redirected to Google Meet. All of today's speakers will be there and we will have some quizzes and interactive activities for all of us to be part of. We hope to see you all there. Thanks so much. Thank you.